now joined by a politician and member of parliament who serves as the deputy leader and chief strategist of the Landless People's Movement, Henny Sebeb. I think the, the, the first question to set the scene is the how you received the news, where were you, and how did it make you feel that moment in time? Uh, yes, indeed, I was at home. Uh, I was watching, as usual, some movies on Netflix and some YouTube music when uh, I received the news because I like watching mo movies early mornings. Mm -hmm. It's so quiet and so on. So I, I, I first encountered the news on the social media, X, and, and, and around about five, six, when I woke up, some of my colleagues called me, uh, and then they shared the news with me also. But uh, I was very much sad, taken aback, because I was thinking this is the last journey that we were supposed to go. I did not expect that we are not going to have a sauna this year without him, mm -hmm. because we wanted to offer to say, look, we did all well, and, and, and we were thinking this would be amongst one of the last sonas that we'll give so that he could provide us what he has done, uh, clarify to us what we thought we should now take over the mantle, all mm -hmm. of us as Namibians, and not only as politicians, but all over. As uh, Honorable Franz Kapofi was now saying, he was good at identifying leadership talent. Mm -hmm. And that is, I thought, uh, he would left us and still guide us in society uh, beyond his presidency. That's what we thought, to, to, to look up to him for wise counsel yeah. as an elder statesman mm -hmm. of Africa. Absolutely. Uh, before the establishment of LPM, of course, you were part of the Swapo uh, party as well. You also worked for, for the party. Talk to us about your journey uh, in, in politics and also uh, going through the ranks of the Swapo Youth League mm -hmm. and the leadership that was provided um, through Hagi Gengob at that time as a member of the party. What did you make of him as a leader? Uh, look, uh, he came at the time, uh, let me rather say, I was working as a special assistant mm -hmm. to the then Secretary General of Swabo, Madame Pendukini Ivolaitana, and the Deputy Secretary General was uh, the current president, Nangolo Mbumba. So a five-year stint, and what I would pick up, because we were now tasked to form a secretariat to take minutes in the Politburo and at the Central Committee, one of the things that I could pick up from him was uh, when change occurs, change can be either painful or that change you can see an opportunity in it and overcome the change. So he brought for me a wisdom. Uh, uh, he, he could see hope into Namibia and Africa. Remember, during those days, we used to talk more about the African Renaissance, mm -hmm. uh, the rebirth of Africa. Uh, the post-colonial African history is replete of uh, mass ad maladministration, corruption, uh, ethnic wars, religious wars, and so on. And he has lived through that era, mm. and, and he could bring now the experiences that has shaped him while he was in Zambia and elsewhere into the current administration. So it was a continuous wisdom that he provided, the hope that he has provided, and more especially the fairness and justice and transparency that he was calling for. Mm. So even in the Politburo that time, he was always a fair man. Uh, for example, if somebody, you know, politicians like accusing each other of things, you will always say, no, let's investigate, come up with a report, and provide recommendations that will unite all of us and take all of us forward. Mm. That was the man that I could recall. And more especially because we were young, he was able to provide African history to us. Mm. Um, in meetings, he will always take examples, case studies. That's why you will see... He didn't like wars, and he was more saying we must use diplomacy, diplomatic skills, and, and diplomatic platforms to resolve any conflicts that we may face at home or abroad. Mm. That was the key thing. You mentioned um, 
about expecting the late president to address the state of the mm. nation, to give his last address, mm. you know, of the a state of the nation address. Mm. Um, one thing comes to mind when you, when you think mm. about the sauna, mm. the, there was a, uh, a very interesting event that played out. Mm. Tempers fled and uh, unfortunately you had to be carried out mm. uh, out of parliament. Um, talk to us about that day because some people read through it as saying, well, you know, it was being disrespectful to the head of state. Or it's just that the thing, or it's just that the thing that politicians do is it uh, funfair. Or talk to us about that day, and you know, later on when you reflected mm. uh, on it uh, with him, uh, maybe through uh, your visits through at, at state house, or maybe in another um, uh, um, 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 space, um, how did it make you feel? No, uh, let, let, let me start with the last one. Uh, we went to the state house. Uh, we provided the president with a document, SLPM what we think should be done. And he took that document mm -hmm. and distributed it to cabinet ministers and to the high commissions and embassies. So you will see, despite whatever happened in Sona at that particular point in time, mm -hmm. we could still, because the idea is that perhaps if there is a little bit of conflict, then you tend to understand each other much more better. And then he was able to welcome us to State House. And we gave him the documents that we gave him. And then we moved forward. That is now why last year we pushed for a motion in Parliament, more especially on green hydrogen. A green hydrogen project, the industrialization of it, and the fast tracking and the commensurate funding of it. So you will see that uh, despite what may have happened, we have overcome that barrier. Mm. Now. The, the, the sauna that you referred to, I think the Speaker of Parliament that time, Professor Peter Kachavivi, completely mis, uh, misread <laughs> the situation. And, and as the result has, has, has proven, the Supreme Court ruled in our favor to say that indeed the Speaker uh, overreached his powers. If the Speaker was calm that day, diplomatic as he is always, none of that would have happened. But you know, in a democracy, when a political party is having a dominant power, they always assume that they are above the laws. But now, that is now for historians, the researchers, and others, political scientists, to write books about uh, and, and, and to talk about it in, in many years to come. So I will leave them to that task, because if I start to talk more about it, they may not have jobs at the end of the day. Mm. Usually when people talk about the opposition parties, mm. uh, what comes to mind is that all they do is criticize, criticize, and criticize government. Mm. Um, looking at the tenure of the late president objectively, uh, what you say, what were some of the highlights for you where you can take your hat off and say, wow, this was a job well done uh, through this man? Mm. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, the Hence, I said we pushed for green hydrogen project so that it is not only at the cabinet level, the ministerial level, so that parliament should also own up to it and to support it. I think that was the highlights of his career. Mm. Uh, amongst other administrative arms, the public uh, administration, the governance institutions that he has set up when he was a prime minister. So during the presidency, the biggest thing that he has pushed for is the Green Hydrogen Project. Uh, and also, of course, the others like the pension grant. And, 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 and he was also in the way to go and realize the Nekertal Dam investment opportunities. I think that one will come soon. We had some workshops in Ketmaso with the minister, Kale Sledvain, last mm -hmm. year. So he was really pushing some ambitious projects. And as you can see now, uh, other African countries are talking about the green hydrogen project mm -hmm. and, and so on. And the other one, we also tabled a motion in parliament on the uh, lithium. Uh, you know what is happening in a Dongres uh, constituency and so on. And then the president came back last year and he imposed a moratorium on the export of the lithium and exactly saying that there must be value addition in Namibia. So those are some of the biggest things and of course, also to fight corruption, you will remember the Hosea Kutako, the, the airport things yeah, and, the and so on. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So he, he really had moments. 
The only drawback was, and this is the nature now, the COVID that came and, and, and the drought that we are still experiencing today. Because okay. Some parts are only rainy. Uh, if, if you now go to southern Namibia, Kunene, youth, the drought is devastating us. Uh, I remember at one time we lost over 50 goats, even ourselves. So, so you can see, uh, if those limitations were not there, I think we would have seen more windfall. But it is always like that. During President Obama's tenure, he imposed or implemented a lot of good economic policies. Mm -hmm. And when President Trump came, he benefited from the policies because now the, the, the automobile industry was now vibrant, the unemployment rate was down. So you can see the benefits will come in the next five years, especially as far as the green hydrogen project in the solar power energy projects and all those related items are concerned. Mm -hmm. We are going to see benefits in the next five years. Mm -hmm. You spoke about um, the ability, diplomatic style of engaging people with, you know, with you know, di divergent views. And, and in this instance, you know, uh, you, you, you have uh, people who believe that whatever the opposition says is wrong. We just follow what this, you know, particular party says. But do you think that his ability to engage with opposition parties has somehow opened the door up for some people to also realize that, hey, listen, what this guy's actually saying is for, for, the, for, for the national interest and not just you know, for, for their own. How has that influenced the interaction now in terms of you know, members of parliament and, 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 and leaders at various levels in understanding that, look, you're looking at it from another perspective. You're not wrong. We, it, let's say, for example, there's a wall. On your side, it's blue, and I'm saying on this side, it's red. We're both mm. right, but we're also both wrong by accusing each other, by saying, well, mm. do you know that other person is insane because they think that that side of the, of, the, of, the, of the wall is red because of my perspective, which is blue, until mm. I come around and say, oh, ho, that's why Henny Sabre was saying this side of, his side of the wall mm. is, is, is red. I, I think uh, I will uh, not put, I, I, I'll rather say, Namibians have come of age. Mm. There is a lot of democratization in Namibia. And you'll even see from the ruling party that they have that robust contestation. Now, much of the maturity in terms of democracy, because we are now exposed to the global media, we see what is happening in other countries. For example, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you will see the Arab regime change that happened, the Arab Spring, and also in Southern Africa, especially the media that we are exposed to, SAPC, Newsweek, uh, Africa, and so on. So I will not say uh, it is because of him. I will rather argue to say the democratization process in Namibia has been carried out by ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when we left Swabo, the dynamics have changed. People have changed. Now we are able to govern two regions when the AR movement of Amupanda came in, it has set the, the trend. It has changed the dynamics that we are witnessing. Lastly, when the independent candidate came, uh, Dr. Itula, it has changed the dynamics. So, uh, as I said, democracy is not static. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a dynamic process. It's a changing process. The more people are educated, for example, the more or the, the middle uh, class is, is increasing and expanding. When we have access to technology, when people are no longer in starvation, then therefore also the dynamics in democracy change. Mm. That's why you will see 30 years from now on, you, we, we, we may not have one single party dominating uh, as the old guard is going. The dynamics, the narratives of history also change because we are now going to see the leadership more in the technology sector, artificial intelligence has come. So the more people are educated, and actually that is what Simon uh, Kusner's calf says, uh, when you expand access to education, the inequality drops, mm. unemployment drops, poverty drops. Yeah. But you have to admit that he did embrace these changes. Yeah, he, he, he embraced mm. uh, because the circumstances demand that you need to embrace, and that is the dynamics of a leadership. When you, if you look at the HR studies, 
uh, what is a transformational leader, for example, as opposed to a, a dictatorial or an autocratic leader, if you take from the human resource studies and, uh, and, and, and so on. It, it, you have to adapt. If you don't adapt to change, then you are holding the nation back. And, and that is the key challenge that we face in most of the African countries. If the leadership is constantly not changing and modernizing, embracing new methods of management, leadership styles, then you will be left behind and the others will move forward. That is key. Yeah. Uh, just to wrap up, I think through the conversations that we've had with various people about the multifaceted uh, life of uh, the late president, some people are only realizing now how much of a big deal this man was, mm. the, the contribution that he, uh, that he made in terms of like the, 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 the drafting of the constitution, uh, his uh, leadership uh, in Zambia while um, at the helm of, of Union, uh, his, his, his activities at, you know, at the, the UN and, and all these uh, uh, multilateral organizations. Um, how do you think now people remember him, now that they know so much about it. Unfortunately, it has, some, unfortunately, it has mm. to take death mm. for somehow you know, people to start understanding and mm. you know, digging up research and, and actually appreciating individuals mm. uh, like the late president. But how do you think mm. wherever he is, uh, would he mm. like to be remembered and the legacy that he has left behind? Mm. I, I like your question. I, I was reading a few days ago a book by Professor uh, William Malekapuru Mahopa. He tried to analyze the transformational leadership in South Africa, first from President Mandela to Thabo Mbeki to uh, Jacob Zuma to Ramaphosa. And he was saying, look, we have to appreciate the different dynamics of, of leadership. Uh, how I will remember him is the vision setting that is provided. You know, you plan a project like the Green Hydrogen Project, and he ensured to live through it, he made sure that investors, etc., are coming, signing up. And so, so in terms of, uh, if you look at it from a project management perspective, you will see that that is what the project manager must do. You give vision, you give commensurate funding, mm -hmm. you allocate resources in terms of human capital and ensure that it is uh, seen. So I think uh, that is the greatest thing that people will miss. You know, when uh, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah died also, mm. they were accusing him of a lot of things. But I think Kwame Nkrumah was years ahead of his time. What he was talking of in terms of industrialization of Africa, we are now talking at the AU level. Mm. Namibia, while I was now in parliament two years ago, only ratified the industrialization policy of SADC. So long past the leaders are gone, mm. they will realize when he was saying this, he was far ahead, 10 years ahead. People are criticizing Green uh, Hydrogen Project. But in 10, 20 years to come, we are going to appreciate and say, this is what a visionary leader was doing. So in terms of vision setting, in terms of goal setting, he was very good at it. And in terms of project management, he was also very good at it. Those are the key attributes that I think leadership across, whether you are in the sports industry, uh, whether you are in the creative art industry or religious industry, teachers, everybody should embrace that type of ethics. Then we are going to achieve whatever we have set for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Sabib, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.